I don't know how to swim. No, really, I, I don't know how to swim. I grew up in a desert town in Tucson, Arizona, and I never had the desire or the need to learn how to swim. So Diane, Daniel, and I returned from a week vacation in the Poconos on Thursday night, right before Harvey. And on Saturday night, I was frantically trying to raise up boxes of photos and documents and other items that I thought were precious, trying to raise them up a few feet off the floor. But as we watched the water level of the bayous rise, something that we could do from the internet, as most of us did, and as we watched the continuous coverage of the storm on the news, I started to imagine the water creeping into our house from under the foundation and through the bathroom plumbing. And I imagined the water level rise up several feet, forcing us perhaps into our attic, where Daniel and I had strategically placed some bottles of water and food. But we didn't have an ax to hack through the roof to be rescued by helicopter if necessary. So then what would we do? And as the internet showed that the bayou nearest our home was about to run over the brink, Daniel noticed on the news that there was going to be a break in the rain for about one hour. We quickly made a reservation at a nearby hotel that said they were not flooding. And we found a way to drive through certain streets that had not yet flooded. And we escaped at three in the morning, in the dark, to a safe, dry hotel room where I slept for about two hours. We were sure our home had flooded. The three of us had a conversation in the hotel lobby about what we would do next. If our home was flooded, would we rebuild? Would we downsize and live in a smaller space, a second floor condo perhaps? Would Daniel be able to go back to school at Hebrew University? We watched the reports of friends and members of our congregation on Facebook. The hotel still had internet and electricity. We contacted a few dozen of them, a family that had to be rescued from their attic, others rescued by boats and taken to shelters. Some were doing the rescuing in their kayaks or boats. And much of this happened in the terrifying darkness of night. As we learned a day later, still in our hotel room, our home miraculously did not flood. But hundreds of our friends and neighbors did. And as the days passed, we called and visited and saw the devastating effects of the worst natural disaster in US history. And I don't need to tell you this morning that it was also the second or third time that many of our families had flooded in a little more than two years. For those of us who didn't flood, of course, we did not fully appreciate the devastating effect of a flood in your home, losing all your precious possessions, not to mention the terrifying experience of watching it happen, and of course the enormous financial loss and the ongoing time-consuming stress of dealing with insurance and FEMA and contractors and everything else. But we see the pain on, the fr on the, our friends' faces, we hear it in their voices, and we see the remnants of households strewn on the lawns of our neighborhood. We all suffer from PTSD. We all shiver now when it rains. But some of us clearly hurt more than others. And those of us who hurt a little less have to be out there helping a little more. And now less than four weeks later, as most homes have been cleaned out and most people have found a temporary place to live and most people have returned to work, the trauma is still there, and we've come together here in this, this beautiful space to bring comfort and support to each other at this time of great pain and uncertainty. And then we read in our prayer books a prayer written perhaps 1,500 years ago, and its words are penetrating, frightening, and disturbing. It's almost as if it were written about us by someone who experienced this same trauma, but the words seem to reflect a theology that I personally found, find outrageous and even offensive. I'm referring, of course, to one of the central prayers of the High Holy Days, 
a prayer we call Unitana Tokef. The prayer paints a picture of God as an old man sitting on a throne with the book of life open before him, and each of our life stories is written in the immense book, and each of our stories has been signed and attested to by us, as if to say, yes, I did that. And based on what's written in this book about each one of us, God judges us and then issues a decree about what will happen to us in the coming year. Who will live and who will die? Who by fire and who by water? Really? Was Hurricane Harvey really an act of God sent to punish us? God forbid. I find that absolutely unacceptable. I absolutely refuse to believe in a God who sends such devastation to punish his own creatures. Yes, we read the story of Noah and the flood of his generation. And a lot of ink has been spilled in trying to understand the meaning of that story as well. But let's be honest here. We do not live in Noah's world. Science has explained a great deal for us about how the world works. We know where storms come from based on the laws of physics. What we now know is that God created a world that operates according to fixed rules. And thank God it does. Otherwise, we would live in a world of chaos. Gravity would only keep us grounded if God chose to let it do so. Tomorrow, God might choose to let us float out into space. Physics is what gives us a sense of security and stability about the world that we live in. We can understand how and why things happen and we can plan for them and find ways to adapt or change the environment to make it less dangerous and more comfortable. Our understanding of physics has inspired brilliant engineers to create indoor plumbing. We don't have to go to outhouses anymore, thank God. Can I have an amen? amen? It's inspired other engineers to discover and make use of electricity. We can work late at night even if we don't want to, because we know how to make light bulbs. We have air conditioning that makes Houston summers not only tolerable, but actually pleasant. Thank God. Can we have an amen? We know how to build houses that keep out the rain and protect us from strong winds. And we have turned Houston, which used to be swampy land in parts, into habitable areas with a water system that has until recently, for the most part, kept us safe and dry. We've been able to do all of that because God created a world for us that we can explore, experiment with, and understand. And we can fix it only because we know and can rely on the rules which nature operates under. And in my opinion, also because God has given us the knowledge and wisdom and discernment to understand how this world works. And he has given us the inspiration to find ways to make it work even better. Our generation in the United States has grown up living in a remarkably ordered and comfortable lifestyle, thanks to science and engineering. We live in a world of modern medicine that has eliminated most causes of childhood death and found ways to overcome or manage many physical disabilities. Thank God, amen. Part of the reason we are so traumatized today is because we have become used to the idea that we can have a somewhat stable lifestyle. But in many ways, that is a luxury of the generation we live in and the good fortune we have to be living in a very prosperous and stable society in the United States. We have only to think about what life was like only a century or two ago without the miracles of modern technology or what life is like today in many other countries around the world that are ravaged by warfare or famine and are not so technologically developed. We have only to think about that to realize how fortunate we are to live here in America today. I'm not saying that we're not traumatized. I'm too fixated by everyone's postings on Facebook and patrolling the streets of our neighborhood and talking to our members and watching the news. We are traumatized especially and particularly those people whose homes were flooded. 
and many of us will be traumatized for many more months, and those whose homes were flooded have a right to be so. Harvey was, in fact, the worst natural disaster in U.S. history. But with all of that, we have a lot going for us, and I think that by reinterpreting Unatana Tokif, we can actually find comfort and a sense of direction that will lead us through these difficult days, weeks, and months. So what does Unatana Tokif mean to me today? If you take out the concept that God is judging us and meeting out a reward or punishment, what the prayer is really telling us is a deeper truth. Life is actually fragile, and each day of our lives is a precious gift. None of us knows who will live and who will die in the coming year. None of us knows who will prosper and who will not. None of us knows who might face a terrible illness or who might win the lottery. But we do know, based on the laws of nature, that some of these things will happen to some of us. And because we're used to living in a stable and relatively comfortable world, all the more so, at least in a normal year, we need to be reminded of the fact that life is precious and that our time on Earth is precious. And most importantly, what we do with our lives will determine how we will judge ourselves when we look back over the years. So Unatana Tokif reminds us of this fragility and preciousness of life, something we may not need this year. But then the prayer upends its gloomy forecast of who will live and who will die, because in the end, the prayer tells us that despite whatever direction life takes us, three things, three things, can change the nature of our lives. In the Hebrew, it says, Teshuva utefila utzdaka ma'avirin et roa hagazera. Now, the expression ma'avirin et roa hagazera is difficult to explain. It could be translated to mean that these three things can remove the severity of the decree. Or in other words, these three things can give us strength and purpose in dealing with the challenges we will inevitably face in life. The gezera, the decree, is not a defined decree of punishment from God, but rather a consequence of living in a world of physics that is blind to justice and fairness. A world that is morally imperfect because it was not designed to be moral. The decree is the simple fact that life is fragile, but also beautiful and precious. So these three things, teshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah, help us navigate the fragility of life and give us a framework for infusing our lives with lasting value. So what are these three things? Teshuva is often translated as repentance, but it comes from the same Hebrew root as lashov, which means to return. And I like to think of repentance as a process of thinking about who we are now and who we want to become. After all, if we understand the difference between right and wrong, who among us does not want to see ourselves as being good, kind, compassionate, fair, and honest? But when we look at our behaviors honestly, we realize that we have fallen short of this ideal vision of who we want to be. So teshuva is the process of being honest with ourselves, reminding ourselves of what is truly important in our lives and determining how we can fully realize our best nature. Teshuva is an ongoing process, something we can and perhaps should ritualize every single day. Take a few minutes each day to think about what we have done right and where we've fallen short and to resolve to do better tomorrow. The Jewish daily prayers actually incorporate this process into the words we pray. If we focus on those words, we'll be guided into becoming better people. But in the Jewish tradition, we also set aside this period called the High Holy Days to engage in a more rigorous introspection. The prayers of the High Holy Days, including Unatana Tokef, afford us the opportunity to be more thorough in our self-examination and to review our behavior over the period of the past year, comparing this year to the one that came before, and then resolving to be better in the coming year. Teshuva, then, is the necessary process of self-assessment that reminds us to make the most of our time on Earth, to find meaning in our lives, and to encourage us to strengthen our relationship with family and friends, to build a better community, and to nurture our minds and our souls and take care of our bodies. 
Teshuvah is the necessary process of course correction, returning to a better path for the future. Tefillah, of course, means prayer. And our prayer books are full of prayers written by people who were steeped in Jewish tradition, in Bible and rabbinic teaching, and who were craftsmen in the art of poetry. But because they wrote in Hebrew and in a difficult poetic style, we often do not fully appreciate their craft. But if you find a prayer in the book that speaks to you, take time to explore the words. Think about how they reflect something you yourself feel right now. Just as in meditation we might focus on one idea, so in prayer we can do the same. The prayers in our books express the full range of human emotion, pouring out our hearts to our Creator. Even though I do not believe in a God who rewards or punishes in this world, I do believe in a God that deeply loves and cares about us and speaks to us in that still small voice in our souls. When we say our Father, our King, we're recognizing that God is like our own parents. God created everything, including life on this planet, including, therefore, each one of us. And as our own parents love us, so too God loves us. God is with us in diversity as in joy. God inspires us to try and live up to our highest ideals. And when we pray, God hears our prayers and understands. While God does not change the law of physics, God can help heal our wounded hearts. Prayers are poetry. And as with all poetry, they're written in a language that's filled with many meanings. Our sages tell us that the Torah has 70 different faces. The Torah can be interpreted in countless different ways. And the prayers in our books are just like that, filled with many meanings. But we have to be creative in unpacking those meanings so that we can discover within them the thoughts and the emotions that we ourselves have, but we somehow don't have the right words to express. And sometimes, sometimes we can trip over a prayer that we might have not have thought was relevant at first at all, but suddenly changes how we view our current life circumstance. One of my favorite prayers in the prayer book is one that gives thanks to God. Modim anachnulach. Now, giving thanks to God after a flood is probably not the first thing that you thought of. But this prayer reminds us that despite whatever else is going on in the world, the world is still full of miracles, large and small. Life itself is a miracle. How many planets in the universe can support life, let alone sentient life? Humanity itself is a miracle of creation. Love is a miracle. Love is something we cannot see, taste, smell, or hear. It doesn't have a physical existence, but it's nevertheless very real, and it's very powerful and amazing and beautiful and something we should be grateful for. The experience of loving someone and of being loved. Can I have an amen? amen? Prayers like this remind us of the infinite value and blessing of life itself. Prayers help us put a context and framework on each day, week, month, and year. So prayer is the second thing that we are told enables us to cope with the challenges of life. And finally, tzedakah. Of course, this word is mostly used to describe the act of making a donation to a worthwhile charitable organization, or perhaps an individual who is in need. But it can more generally be understood as doing any act of kindness in the world. Although I do not believe that God causes good or bad things to happen to people as a way of reward or punishment, I do believe that God has charged us, humanity, to be God's agents, to do the things that God would do if God could or wanted to violate the laws of physics. We are God's angels performing acts of kindness for others to alleviate the suffering in the world. We are God's angels helping to fight injustice. We're God's angels clothing the naked, those who lost their clothes in the flood. We're God's angels feeding the hungry, those people who have no kitchens to cook in anymore. We're God's angels providing shelter to those who lost their homes. We're God's angels lending a hand to clean out a home that's been ruined by polluted water. We're God's angels when we spend time with someone who just needs a listening ear. And we're God's angels when we empathize with someone who's experiencing the same loss we've experienced or a loss we can only try to imagine. That is the power of tzedakah. 
doing acts of kindness for each other, donating to charitable organizations that provide food, clothing, shelter, or emotional support to those who are in need. When we care about others, we feel better about ourselves. We build stronger communities. And I believe we also magnify and sanctify God's name by doing God's work for God's creation and God's creatures. So by doing these three things, tzedakah, teshuva, tefillah, and tzedakah, we can indeed change the course and meaning of our lives. These three things will help us to build a stronger and more vibrant community. And in doing so, these three things will help us to overcome the challenges of life. It's been a devastating time these past few weeks. It will take a long time to heal the pain. And many of us will no doubt have post-traumatic stress for months or years to come. But I am awed by the amazing response of so many people, so many of our members, so many Houstonians, and people who have come from out of town or sent donations to help those who are in need. I am encouraged by the resourcefulness and resilience and positive energy that has been so positively and prominently displayed in the aftermath of Harvey. We have built a pretty good life in Houston with all kinds of modern technology, and we will rebuild this city. And it will be stronger and more resilient than ever before. How do I know? Because I lived through two earthquakes in Los Angeles, and it's now a larger, stronger, and more vibrant city than ever before. San Francisco recovered from a devastating earthquake at the turn of the century, and it is thriving and much, much larger today. In short, humanity has overcome obstacles like this in the past. And as a religious person, I ascribe our success to God who loves us and cares about us and inspires us with vision and creativity and passion and determination, with hope and with wisdom. Every year at the Passover Seder, we lift up our broken matzah and we say, this year we are slaves. Next year we will be free people. And so too on this Rosh Hashanah, I say to you, this year we may be in shock and disruption, but next year may we be rebuilt and redeemed. Can I have an amen? Lashana Tova. I've heard Rabbi Morgan speak many, many times. I've never seen the passion, and what a message for all of us this year. We will rebuild, and we will be redeemed, and we will have a future in our own home once again, in our own homes once again. It's a powerful message, wonderful.